Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Gearing Central Church of Christ. Uh, glad that you're with us here this morning. If you are visiting with us, Hal and Kathy, and oh, no, that doesn't apply to you necessarily. Anyway, we do want to welcome you if you are visiting with us. And uh, for all of us, if you would uh, fill out a Connect card, that's the little card in the, in the pew in front of you there. And if you have any announcements, prayer requests, things to that nature, if you would uh, drop them off in the offering baskets that are placed in the back of the auditorium. We'd appreciate that very much. Um, you know, even even while we're trying to social distance, you know, that's probably not a, the best biblical word. Social distance doesn't really resonate with me biblically. Uh, but as we attempt to uh, obey those that are in authority over us, I notice that the front rows are still empty. <laughs> this one's not empty, but you guys, most of you guys are headed up to the stage, so. But uh, anyways, uh, there is still some places up here in the front uh, if, you, um, if you need a place to sit. Also, um, we do have some chairs out in the, in the fellowship hall. If we need to set some chairs up in the back in the fellowship hall, we can, we can do that as well. But um, offering plates are two different locations, right? down the center aisle here at the back and right to the, at, as you came in. And today is a special love offering for cross-cultural connection. That's uh, uh, the, the Hong Kong mission, Linda Smith. And uh, the thing about uh, the, the period of time that we're under, we're not passing the plates. And so if you are wanting to leave an offering this morning for our mission, make sure you earmark that check. Uh, because it's not going to be like usual where we pass the general fund offering plates and then the uh, love offering plates. Uh, they're, the plates are the plates. And so please be generous to the local church, but also be generous to our mission, uh, cross-cultural connection. And please indicate on your check uh, where you want that to go. Also, uh, we're under uh, pre-registrations for camps. Uh, if you're wanting to send kids to, to kids' camps this summer, Bible camps, actually we're advertising a lander camp as well. They're called Western Wyoming Christian Youth Camp. We're advertising a couple of weeks of uh, their camp, and there's registration forms out in the foyer there. Specifically, we're advertising that camp this year because Isaac Stewart and Lauren Whaley are willing to take students from Central as they go as uh, leaders from Summit Christian College. Our normal camp that we, uh, you know, basically send our kids to on a, on a yearly basis is Nebuiadak, and, and and so we're we're just promoting both camps. We're not, uh, anyways. Uh, June 12th is sort of the pre-registration date for either one of those camps, but when you go to get registration forms out in the foyer, there make sure you know there's a pile for for the Wyoming camp, and then there's a pile for the Nebuiadak camp. And, and so um, if you'd get those uh, turned in to the main office this week to get the pre-registration price and guarantee a t-shirt, uh, you should do that uh, this week. <clears throat> I hope that was clear as mud. There's a reception here next Saturday for... Stand up. Stand up. Those two. And then Justin Santos as well. That's going to be in the... Fellowship Hall next Saturday for, uh, I think, starting at 5 o'clock. Uh, so um, come out and support Natalie and Jacob and Justin, and uh, they'd appreciate that very much. Uh, you can read your bulletins. I do want to just make mention of Howard and Imogene Briggs. Not too many times we get to promote a 70-year uh, anniversary celebration. That would be Rachel's Russia's grandparents, 70 years, and they are having a card shower on June 11th. And so if you'd like to send a card to the Briggs, their address is in the bulletin. That would be a special time for them. Anything else that I need to announce at this time? Okay, worship team can come on up. I'll pray and we'll get going. God, we thank you for this day. Thankful for your love and grace and thank you for this opportunity to be in this place. And God, I'm I'm praising your name for brothers and sisters that can uh, meet together and we can just draw closer to you and closer to one another. And this is a, a good spot to be in. God, we recognize that we live in a culture where everything's not good. 
Matter of fact, there's a lot of things that are really bad right now. And God, we're praying for um, the riots and the protests and all, all that kind of stuff. God, I'm just, I'm just praying for uh, this nation that, um, that this nation could sense that uh, it's going the wrong direction and, and that, um, that we could see men and women and children turning back to you. God, I pray that you would be with the Christians that inhabit this nation, that we would be salt and light, and that we wouldn't care who we're talking to or where they're from or what color of skin they have. God, I pray that we as Christians would be reaching out with your love to every person we meet. And God, um, we, we know that if, if people can know Jesus, that uh, they can know peace. And so, God, we uh, would pray that you would use us to be instruments of peace wherever you take us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, it's so good to see all of you here this morning. Let's stand and worship together. To God be the glory. a fun song to sing, isn't it? To God be the glory. We praise his name today and forevermore. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, his love is Love endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise.
rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Why don't you give a wave to those around you, say good morning, and then you can be seated. shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. And thousands elsewhere, then thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask, and I would see to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. One thing I ask, and I would seek, I seek your face, to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you, to you. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. 
Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere than thousands elsewhere. Do you believe that this morning? Better is one day in his presence than anywhere else we could ever be. Lyle's going to share this scripture this morning. It says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And that is exactly what that scripture is talking about right here in this song. Better is one day in his house than thousands elsewhere. So we come to our time of prayer this morning. Uh, All you have to do is look around and see the need. There's so much need uh, in our world today, uh, so much hopelessness and despair, and yet we have the answer to all of that in Jesus Christ. So we praise him this morning for his presence here. We praise him for his work throughout the world. And I pray that I may be just a small part of that, and I, I pray that you would be a small part of that as well as we reach out to the community around us. Are there any prayer requests that need to be brought before us today? Very good. Then if you would just take the next few moments, lift your hearts to God in prayer, and I will close us. Father, we thank you for this morning where we can gather together in your presence and celebrate you. May you be glorified. May you forever be honored as we come into your presence. Lord, as as we consider the things going on around us, so much confusion, so much hatred and anger, uh, Father, I pray that we would not be a people who point fingers but a people who would show the way. Lord, may we lead people to you through this dark time. May they see the light of Jesus' love as it flows from us. Use us as your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Stories of the Bible. Josiah. This is Josiah. Josiah became king of Israel when he was only eight years old. Yep. Now the country of Israel had a very long line of kings who did many bad things, including Josiah's father and grandfather. These kings did not follow after God, and they ignored his commandments and his law. But when Josiah became king, he did what God wanted him to and followed the example of King David. 18 years after Josiah became king, he sent one of his court secretary, Shaphan, to God's temple. Thank you. Many of the kings before Josiah did not take good care of God's house, so it was in need of repair. Hmm. Oh. While they're in the temple, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, Hey! I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. So Shaphan took the scroll back to King Josiah and read it to him. (laughs) When Josiah heard what was in the book, he was greatly upset. Oh, no! Because the people of Israel were not doing the things that God asked him to do, and Josiah knew that God must be angry with Israel for not obeying his commandments. Josiah gathered together all the people of Israel to the temple and read the entire book of the covenant to them. That very day, Josiah and all the people promised that they would obey all of what God commanded with all their hearts and souls. Josiah went on to help Israel become a people fully committed to God 
he tore down all the other temples and the idols that they had set up. He got rid of all the people who were doing bad things all throughout Israel. And he did all that was commanded in God's book. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and soul and strength, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king like him since. So kids, he started out at age eight. How many of you are age eight? We got one eight-year-old. I think you could be the next president. I think the lesson there, though, is for all of us, do whatever we can to obey the commands of the Lord, right? Maybe you heard about uh, the wife and the, the husband. They're at the doctor's office. And just so that we can keep our place in the story here, why don't we give the wife's name Kathy and let's go with Hal for the, <laughs> give them a little welcome back here. We'll let them be part of the story here. So uh, Kathy and Hal, they're at the doctor's office, you see. And the, the doctor finishes the checkup on, on Hal and He's got this really concerned look on his face. And Hal, he's excited. Well, how did I do, doctor? And, and the doctor said, well, I'll tell you, I just, if you just step outside, I'd just like to have a few minutes with, you, with your wife, and, and uh, we'll buzz you in the waiting room when, when it's time for you to come back. And so Hal says, that's fine. He walks out into the waiting room, and um, by this time, Kathy's got that, you know that concerned look on her face? Show us the concerned look. Yeah, there, there's the concerned look. Uh, and so she says, what is it, doctor? And, and uh, you know, is, is, is Hal going to be okay? Is, is, is he going to die? And the doctor looks pained at this point. And he takes a deep breath and he says, ma'am, I'm afraid I have very bad news for you. Hal is terribly ill. And uh, it's one of the worst cases that I've ever seen. And he's on his way out. And uh, Kathy gasps, and her hand flies to her mouth, and, and she's just, you know, beside herself. Is there anything that can be done, doctor? Anything at all? And the uh, doctor takes a deep breath and says, uh, well, um, yes, there is something that you can do. Um, and, and, he, and she says, well, anything, anything at all. And uh, the doctor takes a deep breath, and he says, well, you must, you must treat him like a king among men. You just have to treat him like a king among men. Um, and Kathy's a little confused, and what, what do you mean by that? And, and the doctor says, well, you must, you must just wait on him day and night. You must serve him three home-cooked meals a, a day for breakfast. He needs the whole works every single breakfast, pancakes, eggs, bacon. How's this sounding so far, Hal? Great, yeah, and then you're going to get a home-cooked lunch every day, and he needs a full cook dinner every night. We're talking not, you know, canned goods. We need meat and potatoes and, and all his favorite baked goods all week long. And you need to know that his immune system is uh, weak, and that means you'll have to keep the house spotless at all times. And he'll need plenty of physical attention as well. And if he wants you to read to him or rub his feet or scratch his back, uh, you just have to do it 24-7. He's got to be a king among men. And if, uh, if you do all of that, then Hal can expect a full recovery. And so Kathy thanks the doctor, and she leaves the office to find Hal out in the waiting room. And, and Hal says, well, wh what did he say? What's, what's, what's happening? And Kathy, with a very somber look, says, Hal, you're going to die. I know. <laughs> That's the thing about Lyle's humor. You've all heard it a, you know, a few times. So, 
The, the title to the sermon is The Right Perspective. The Right Perspective. We're in Philippians chapter 1, 21 through 24. The Right Perspective. Uh, what an awesome picture that is. If you're, the, if you're the guy on the island, your perspective is, hey, a boat. That's the best news I've heard all day long. There's a boat coming. And of course, if you're uh, out in the boat and you've been out in the boat all that time and you, f- you see land, oh, there's land, there's hope, I can get off this boat. And so uh, just a really kind of a cute um, um, Picture, a couple of pictures are side by side that really does fit, fit the sermon. Uh, I can appreciate the frustration that uh, Charlie Brown has in his Peanuts cartoon, like the one where Lucy is philosophizing and, and Charlie is listening, and as usual, Lucy kind of has the stage and she has the floor there, and she's delivering one of her lectures, and she says, Charlie Brown, life is a lot like a deck chair. And I think the wording might be a little bit different than what I'm sharing here, but some place it so they can see where they've been. Others place it to see where they're going. On the cruise ship of life, Charlie Brown, which way is your deck chair facing? And Charlie Brown sighs and he says, I can't even get mine unfolded. More than few of us can identify with Charlie Brown, can't we? Life gets rough at times. Life is, life is rough at times. And some of the choices we have to make are very difficult. You know, like what brand of saran wrap we need to buy and things, you know, difficult choices in life. Um, my car got saran wrap, Chris, this week. Yeah. I think it was some of our teenagers here that go to Central even. Can you imagine? It sounds like a crime. And the only reason yours didn't get done is you live too far out in the country. But life gets, I'm not going to mention any names from the pulpit, though, because that's not me. Because, I mean, just look out in the crowd right now. See the girls that have the red faces. (laughs) But life gets rough at times, doesn't it? Some of the choices we have to make are difficult. We find ourselves, like the old saying, between a rock and a hard spot. Uh, stuck between two possibilities where an argument could be made for going either way. Uh, such a situation is called a dilemma. Have you ever been in a dilemma? Have you ever had a dilemma? There are different kinds of dilemmas. Some dilemmas are known as volitional dilemmas. That's where we want to do two things at the same time. Young couples who have been married for two or three years, sometimes less, are often you know, they're trying to finish their schooling, yet are anxious to start a family. What should they do? To start having children means extra financial pressure and an even greater strain on time and energy. But to wait several years means that they may be in their 30s and, and they really want to begin parenting earlier than that. And so what do they do? Either way, it's an either or. It's not, not necessarily a wrong way and a right way. It's just two sort of extremes, and they're in a dilemma. Uh, emotional dilemmas are even more intense. This takes place when, when we have different feelings about the, the same event. For example, suppose a child has had a, a pet, a pet for many years, and, and the bond between them and the pet is inseparable, but the animal has this incurable disease that makes it more and more miserable, and you, you know what the dilemma is. To provide the pet relief means putting it to sleep, but that's a very painful option. And if you think that one's difficult, then how about dealing with uh, an adult rebellious son or daughter? Uh, He or she has moved out of the house and maybe is living a lifestyle that's disappointing to God and to you, but it's obvious that they could use some financial assistance. In fact, they've even asked for it. Can, can you help us out? Do you help them or do you turn them down? This is your kids. It's an, it's an emotional dilemma. And it's going to tear you up no matter what you decide to do. I think of church leadership right now. I think church leadership is 
uh, an emotional dilemma right now. We, we, we need to decide what ministry looks like in the future. Uh, how long will we need to social distance? How long until we can put our children's ministry programs back in place? How long till we can offer a nursery? How long until we can pass the offering and the communion plate? These are in some ways very emotional decisions because people that we all love and respect have differing opinions. And because you have a different opinion doesn't make you a bad person. It's just that you have a different, different slant on it. And so, uh, and, and we, we love and respect all, all, the, all the different parties here. You know, some think that this entire thing is a hoax. And we should already be back doing whatever ministry we want to be doing. And others think that this COVID-19 is still very dangerous and, and we maybe shouldn't be doing what we're already cautiously doing. And so we have a dilemma. And it's a very emotional dilemma. And then there are geographical dilemmas that occur when we want to be in two places at the same time. You ever been there? Maybe you love where you've been living for years, but moving would mean a raise in salary, not to mention the opportunity to make new friends, enjoy some much-needed change. But leaving would be difficult because of the kids who are now teenagers and the long-standing relationships you've built up in the church and in your neighborhood and, and with your friends. And you, you weigh both sides, and there's pros and cons, and, and it's, it's all good. Neither is ideal, yet both have their benefits. And so you find yourself in a dilemma, right? And whenever we're faced with a dilemma, we're pulled in two different directions. We, we feel the strain, and we don't quite know what the best thing to do. And I might add that being older and wiser doesn't mean that you're immune to the problem. As Charlie Brown put it, there are times when we all find it very difficult even to get our own deck chair unfolded. And so all that is just sort of a background to our text, really. Uh, all of that brings us to the Apostle Paul, who, who was a prisoner of Rome. He's a prisoner in his own house. He's in house arrest. If you're familiar with the book of Philippians, you know that, that Paul reacted positively to his circumstances, and he wrote a joyful letter of encouragement to his brethren in Philippi. In fact, the Philippian letter is best sum, summed up in chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it, rejoice. Somebody asked me recently if I was starting a new sermon series. Well, it was actually my mother-in-law. She said, because she, she watches online each week, so, hi, Mom, we are online. I kind of forget we're online, but we are online. So we're coming to see you soon. Uh, but she, she asked me in an email the other day was, uh, uh, are you starting this new series in Philippians? And I, honestly, I don't know. I've preached a couple times out of Philippians recently. But there's so much negativity in this world, so much stuff that is happening around us. I just, I've been thinking, I sure like Philippians because it, it's always my go-to book when I want to find joy, when I want to find reasons to rejoice, when I, when I look around and I just see the, the crud that this world is, is facing and I, I just want to, I want to find some joy, and I want to bring you guys some joy from the pulpit. And so maybe, maybe I am. i got a week to think about it now. What, where am I going to go? But Philippians might just be uh, the answer. But even with such a positive attitude, Paul admitted that he had a dilemma of his own. He had a dilemma of his own, even, even though this is a book of joy and it, he had a positive attitude. Um, his dilemma was this. If he died and went to heaven, so be it. That would be just fine with him. He, he, you know, he's not going to go out and, you know, take his own life, but uh, he, he's ready to go at any time, God. If you want to take me today, it's, it's fine. Uh, if he died and went to heaven, so be it. That's fine with him. If he lived, so be it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to represent Christ today. If God doesn't take me today, I'm going to live for Christ today. And uh, he had an earthly home and he had a heavenly home, and whichever one he was living in was just fine with him. 
dead or alive, he's going to rejoice. He's going to be happy. And so our text is Philippians 1, 21 through 24, which simply says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, for you, the, the church, the, the body, the ones that he was ministering to. And so as we read that text, we see that there was a struggle or a dilemma going on in Paul's heart. There was a place that blessed his heart, and there was a people that burdened his heart. They were both very dear to his heart. He longed for them both, but it put him in a unique dilemma. Paul said in verse 23, I am hard-pressed between the two. That word hard-pressed means it speaks of something that's compressed. It means distressed or hard-pressed or to be put in a dilemma. It spoke of someone that was in a place where they could neither turn to the right or the left. And Paul's dilemma involved happiness for himself. And I, I don't mind being happy. Happiness for himself or helpfulness for others. Maybe others' needs are more important than my own happiness. There was a desire to die and go on to heaven and enjoy the glories of a special place. There was also that desire to live and encourage the growth of a special people, which would be better. He said in verse 22, I do not know which to choose. Paul was struggling with this matter of living or dying. He was not sure which would be the best. I wonder, though, in most of our cases, we're, we're doing everything we can to live, really, I think. We, we sing, shout, and say we can't wait to get to heaven, but then as soon as we have a sickness, we're doing everything we can to, to get better. Uh, we usually do all we can to live, not die. You don't find many with the kind of dilemma that Paul had. The reason is that we are unfamiliar with that which is above us, we're just so unfamiliar with that which is above us and unfortunately, I think sometimes unconcerned with those who are around us. We love what's ahead of us or above us and sometimes we get so wrapped up in ourselves that we forget and we're not concerned about those around us. Let's consider Paul's dilemma. First, we see his desire for the end of life. It's, it's very obvious that one of the things Paul is struggling about is the matter of dying. In Paul's case, it was not a dread of death, but it was a desire for death. He wasn't hoping that he wouldn't die. He was praying that he would. He said in verse 23, having a desire to depart. Death for many is a very gloomy subject. I know that because I've been around a lot of it. It's a very gloomy subject for, for many. We all know that we're going to die. We know that in the back of our mind that we're going to die. But until then, we'd just rather not talk about it. I think many of us feel like Dr. Lakin, who once said, if I knew where I was going to die, I wouldn't go there. You may have heard the expression, uh, the dead man's hand. It originated on August 2nd. 1876, Wild Bill Hickok sat down at a poker table in saloon number 10 in Deadwood, South Dakota. Jack McCall entered the saloon and shot Wild Bill through the head. In Hickok's hand was a pair of aces and a pair of eights. That combination has ever been known as the dead man's hand. I say that to say this. All of us have been dealt the dead man's hand. And sooner or later, we're going to have to play it. Yet, when that hand is dealt, it is not something woeful to fear, but something 
wonderful to face. I've been at the bedside of a dying non-Christian, and I've been at the bedside of a dying Christian. And the difference is between night and day, the expression on their face. The expression on the non-Christian face is fear and terror and what's next. And the, the, the look on the Christian face is, it's been a good ride and I'm, I'm ready to move on. Notice how Paul described death. He speaks of how death introduces a better life. He said to die is gain. And I think when a Christian is, you know, the faculties are still there, but they know that the, that the end is near, the, the communication I've had is they can hardly wait to get to where they've been wanting to go all their life. To die is gain. The, the word gain is a word that means profitable. It was used to speak of interest that money had gained. Paul was saying death is not terrible but profitable. Now notice what it was in particular that Paul considered a gain in death. Notice verse 23, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Christ had been with him but death would allow him to go on and, and be with Christ. Paul had lived for Christ, but he had a desire to live with Christ, which to him was a far better life. To Paul, death didn't put him in a cemetery. And that's the beautiful thing is we might, we might bury the body of a dead person in a cemetery, but if they know Jesus, they're, they're not there. They're, they're not in that cemetery. That there was Jesus. Paul knew that death didn't put him in a cemetery. It ushered him into the sanctuary. Although I've never seen it, I've been told there's a headstone in a cemetery in Montgomery, Alabama, which reads, ah, huh, that reads a little different than what I get, doesn't it? You told me that, I guess, yeah. Well, under the clover and under the trees, here lies the body of Jonathan Pease. Pease ain't here, only the pod. Pease shelled out and went home to God. The message is the same. I, I really kind of like that. Pease is not here, only the pod. Pease shelled out, went home to God. You know, when I die, you can go visit the, the, pla the place where they laid me to rest, but know that I'm not there. I'm waving to you somewhere wherever heaven is. Death is the vehicle that ushers us into the presence of God. That's why Paul had such a desire to die, and he, that's why he could speak of his death as a gain. Kerry Breck wrote, Face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory I shall see him by and by. It is a blessed life when we live in his abiding presence, but it will be a better life when we live in his actual presence. How encouraging it is that he lives in our heart, but how exciting it is to know that we will live in his home. Here's a blessed thought for you. He is with us. You need a better one? We will be with him. The songwriter said it very well. well. He said, what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Paul also spoke of how death involved a blessed leaving. Verse 23, Paul described the death as a departure. He said, I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ. Paul also described death as a departure. If you remember back in 2 Timothy 4, 6, when he said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. That's a, that's a powerful word in the Scripture, that word departure. 
beautiful word, really. It, it, it's one of those words that has a, just a, a variety of usages. The word was used to describe the dissolution of a chemical. One could take a chemical compound as found in the form of a tablet and drop it into water. And in doing so, the chemical would dissolve. In its dissolving, it would disappear but would not be destroyed. Its form is only changed from a solid to a liquid. When a Christian dies, he disappears, but he or she is not destroyed. The form of life changes from a physical state to a spiritual state. And so it's like we die, but we don't die. We just change the conditions of life. The word was also used to describe the setting free of a prisoner. The prisoner was released from his bondage and chains and allowed to go free. We live this life chained to the limitations and temptations of our body, but death will release us from them. The word was used by a farmer. It described taking the yoke off the oxen. The day of labor was over and it was time to rest from the burden of the yoke and the service in the field. And so death means laying aside of the burdens of life and the completion of our work. The word also described the striking of a tent. It spoke of the untying of the ropes from the stakes, packing up the tent, and moving to a different location. Death is a glorious change of where we dwell. Finally, the word was used to describe the lifting of an anchor. A ship is ready to leave the harbor and sail to a new land. The anchor is lifted. The sails are hoisted. And the vessel sets sail for its new destination. You see, death is a blessed leaving. Death is like stepping on board the old ship of Zion and setting sail for a heavenly land and leaving the old land behind. One day we're leaving out of here. One day we don't have to read the nightly news or watch the nightly news that tells us of who hates who and who killed who and what mob is here and where it's safe to walk and where it's safe not where it's not safe to walk all that's going to be behind one day we're, we're we're getting out of here so no wonder paul said death was better no wonder he desired to die there was the life before him and the life behind him that made him declare that death was better paul was not ter terrified by the prospects of dying someday he was thrilled about the possibility of dying any day. There is nothing to fear about death for one who has obeyed the gospel and is saved. You should fear death if you're not saved. But if you have confessed Jesus as your Lord, you've repented of your sins, you've been immersed into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you have nothing to fear at your time of death. We also see Paul's decision for the extension of life. He decided on an extension of life. Paul had a desire to die, but he made a decision to live. He struggled with what was better and what was best. And finally, he settled it in his heart that it would be the best to stay. Why? Because Paul had discovered, and I, I, I really want each one of us to discover, that life has meaning. Life has meaning. Paul said in verse 21, for me to live is Christ. I, I can't think of a greater statement found in the Scripture, in the, in the Word of God, than that statement, for to me to live is Christ. It's a statement of purpose. It's a statement of meaning. It revealed what the true essence of life was for Paul. What is the meaning of life for you? How do you fill in the blank? For me to live is blank. How do you fill it in? What's most important to you? For me to live is success. For me to live is fame. For me to live is pleasure. 
Or do we fill the blank in the same way Paul did? For me to live is Christ. Paul would also write to the church of Galatia, chapter 2, verse 20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. F.B. Meyer said, Christ is the essence of our life, the model of our life, the aim of our life, the solace of our life, the reward of our life. The ultimate objective of life is Christ himself and Christ alone. It's not preaching. It's not singing. It's not ministry. Although those things are really important, the most important thing, if you had to nail it down to just one word or a phrase, is Christ in Christ alone. He also explained that that life is ministry. Paul thought of happiness for himself, but then he thought of helpfulness for others. The place above, above him pulled at him, the heaven pulled at him, but the people around him held him. He longed to go to heaven, but he really felt the need to, to minister to people. He said, I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Paul always put the needs of others before his. How, how are we doing in that category? How are we doing at putting the needs of others before our own? Paul was always committed to Christ he was always concerned about others. I think of some of the strongest language when it, uh, when it comes to you know, how far you would go to uh, reach your loved one for Christ. I think some of the strongest language here is in Romans chapter 9. And Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Are there people in your life that you just long for them to come to Jesus? You just, you just long for them. You just have this great sorrow and this great continual grief in your heart. And Paul goes on to say, For I, I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul had a great heart for the lost. And I, I don't know if I'm willing to give up my salvation for someone else, but I think I could do a better job at putting myself out there for the salvation of, of others. Paul was not only willing to postpone heaven for the, for the sake of the saints, but he was also willing to go to hell for the sake of sinners. And I think what a unique and unselfish individual he was. And I think just the, the lesson, the the challenge that I want to put forth is, do we have compassion? Do we have concern for others that we would, how far would we be willing to go to make sure someone else knew Jesus Christ? Our life has meaning and our life has ministry. We should live our lives in view of others. In most cases, life is only thought of in terms of oneself and not Christ, and, and certainly not others. We want to be blessed, but how much do we think about being a blessing? We want to be blessed, but now we need to go out and be a blessing. We want God to do for us, but think little about doing something for God. Someone has given us what is called the carnal alphabet, I just found this, thought this was interesting. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly because it's 26 uh, little posts here. If you want a copy of this, I can email it to you. But this is what's called the carnal alphabet. Self-assertive, my rights. Self-boasting, my deeds. Self-centered, 
my importance, self-defending, my honor, self-esteem, my pride, self-fear, my anxiety, self-gallant, my display, self-hysteria, my nerves, self-indulgence, my desires, self-jealousy, my suspicions, self-kicking, my privileges, self-liberty, my excuses, self-made, my ability, self-narrowness, my opinions, self-offense, my feelings, self-pity, my sacrifices, self-quibbling, my evasion, self-righteous, my profession, self-suppression, my composure, self-talkative, my viewpoint, self-upset, my infirmities, self-vengeance, my rebuttal, self-will, my way, self-x-ray, my discernment, self-yearning, my appetites, self-zeal, my service. I think of the little poem that I heard years ago, and I use this quite a bit at funerals, but this little poem has always been a challenge to my heart. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to prayer, to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. May efforts be to rise again unless to live for others. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. The Wall Street Journal printed an article some time back, How Important Are You? And the article said, How important are you? More than you think. A rooster minus a hen equals no baby chicks. Kellogg minus a farmer equals no cornflakes. If the nail factory closes, what good is the hammer factory? Paderewski's genius wouldn't have amounted to much if the piano tuner hadn't shown up. A cracker maker will do much better if there is a cheese maker. The most skillful surgeon needs the ambulance driver who delivers the patient. Just as Rogers needed Hammerstein, you need someone, and someone needs you. You want to be a world changer? Are you sick and tired of what you read on the news? Are you sick and tired of the way our, our country is? Then you be different. You be different. You change. Lyle needs to change. We need to do whatever it takes to bring hope to that person that God puts in our path this week. You want to see change? Then you be an agent of change. Doesn't matter what color skin people have. It doesn't matter what status of life they're in. It doesn't matter what they drive or where they live. If God puts that person in your path, then you be an agent of change. You look out for others. Lyle's going to look out for others. It was the needs of others that caused Paul to make the decision to live on earth rather than leave for heaven. And may we have that same kind of heart. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. <clears throat> God, I, I pray that we would be convicted here this morning of that very powerful verse that tells us to live is Christ, to die is gain. We are looking forward to getting out of here. We're looking forward to being in, in heaven with you forever. And that doesn't need to be a morbid thought. When it's our time, we look forward to that. But until then, may we be the hands and feet of your Son. May we be committed to, to living our lives for you. May we be committed to spreading love instead of hate. And may we be committed to 
offering people hope instead of hopelessness. Help us to put a smile on our face and, and um, put a message on our lips that remind people that you love them and we love them too. And help us to be agents of change. Help us to be purveyors of peace. Help us to be dispensers of grace. God, work in us this week, even today as we see people, that people will know by our actions and, and uh, our demeanor that, that we belong to you. God, we thank you for your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest end. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to Shall still endure all measure that. 